Welcome to Concept 3 Notes, Metallic Bonds. So if you remember back in Concept 1 Notes, I told you that bonding is a spectrum and we're really only going to talk about a couple of different kinds of bonds and there's a lot of other things that are happening. But really when it comes down to it, chemical bonds are intramolecular forces. They're forces within a compound, between atoms within a compound that are holding them together. And so we're going to introduce a new type today, which are metallic bonds. So if you even just look at these three pictures that represent, here we see an ionic bond happening, here we see a metallic, and here we see covalent, even just from looking at these, you might be able to see how these are different. You know, looking at the ionic one, you see an arrow showing where the electron is going, and then we see that the sodium loses one and the chlorine gains one. So ionic bonds are transferring electrons. And we can see that there's a metal and a non-metal. If we look at the covalent, we see the oxygen and hydrogen, which are both non-metals. We see them circling around electrons so they appear shared. Well, now look at the metallic. See that if we're looking at zinc, it's just all a bunch of zincs. And then all the electrons are kind of just like floating around together. You know, it doesn't really solve a pattern. It's not showing transferring or sharing. What's going on here? That's what a metallic bond, I mean, really is. So it's a bond, and I put that in quotation marks because it's really a better, you know, term would be a chemical attraction. And it's formed from a shared pool of valence electrons. So like all these sodium atoms can be sharing from a pool of all of their one valence extra electrons that they're contributing to this pool. So it's really just like an interaction that's holding these metal atoms together. It does not result in a compound, okay? There's no like sodium compound. It's just like a bunch of sodium together or a bunch of zinc together or something like that. And they don't really lose their valence electrons like in ionic bonds. Instead, they are sharing, but because it's, it's not between different atoms, it's not between nonmetals, it's more they are sharing from this C of E, the C of electrons. And these electrons that they're sharing are specifically delocalized electrons, meaning they're electrons that are not associated with a single atom or a bond. They're all kind of given into the shared pool. They're all able to be used. So, one good thing about this is because they don't result in a compound, you don't have to learn any more naming rules or how to write chemical formulas for them or anything like that. But I do want you to know some things about how they form. So here's kind of how it all works and how this C of E forms. So electronegativity is low. So the attraction of E is low. <laughs> That, I mean, that's how it works. Electronegativity is the ability to attract electrons in a bond. And so it's going to be low. So there's not a lot of attraction there. We also know that metals like to form lattices or lattices, um, which is what we saw in ionic bonds. They're kind of in that rigid organization. But um, metals are often bigger. And especially like what we see with transition metals, they have a lot of these overlapping over orbitals. So when they get close together in these lattices, they, their orbitals start to overlap, the electrons kind of get all mixed up, and no one's really pulling them harder than anybody else. And all of these things are what contribute to this C of E forming. So note that the sodium atoms are like organized. You could even see that on the last picture. They're in, you know, a, a, a uniform layout. But we also see that while the nucleus and kind of the core electrons are set in each one, the valence electrons are really not set. They're floating around. That's what's creating this C. And again, this is forming because there's a lot of overlap in the orbitals of these transition metals especially. And so the electrons get delocalized, and that's where these Cs of E form. And what's cool is you've seen this with ionic and covalent, but the form dictates the function. So the structure of the bond in, within the compound for ionic and covalent determines the properties that ionic and covalent compounds have. Well, so these aren't compounds, but still how this metallic bond forms in metals really creates some of the unique properties that we see in metals, which is cool. For instance, metals are really malleable, which means they can be made into thin sheets, kind of like we see here. We can pound them out into that. They're also ductile, which means we can make them into wires and make them really long and skinny like that, which is helpful because metals are also really good at conducting electrical and thermal energy. And think about why. 
this C of E has all of these E kind of floating around and an electric current is really just the movement of electrons, the flow of electrons. And so it a really the C of E really allows electrons to flow through a material and, and make that electric current because of the way that they're delocalized. And so that really helps with that. Metals are also strong absorbers and reflectors of light. If you go back to our last unit, electrons, in concept one, we talked about the connection between electrons and the electromagnetic spectrum and electromagnetic radiation. And, um, and one thing we see is that they are strong, metals are strong absorbers of light because they have many orbitals, which we also saw in the last unit, and there are really small differences in energy once we get into those bigger and bigger um, atoms and multiple orbitals. And so they can absorb a wide range of light frequencies. It's not like they just have like one type that they can absorb. And so that this makes them really strong at absorbing and reflecting light. And because they're good at absorbing, they're good at reflecting. And because they're good at reflecting, that's what makes them shiny. That's how metals have that metallic appearance. It's because they are reflecting light. Now, one last thing, these are short notes, which is a nice reprieve after concept two's long notes, which were a doozy. Metals have these properties thanks to metallic bonds, and it makes them really, really useful. But oftentimes, metals are even more useful when they are alloys. And an alloy is a solution of two metals mixed together. And so you might be thinking, how do you mix you know, silver and gold? They're solid at room temperature. Well, you have to melt them down first, then mix them to create the solution where they're kind of dissolved into each other, and then let them you know, harden. And... Um, What's interesting is depending on the proportion of the metals in the solution, like how much you have of different ones, you can really create certain properties that you want and you can kind of manipulate that. And the alloys are really used for so much because of their properties. Even pictured here, okay, a pure gold ring, which would usually be considered 24 karat, it's often too soft to use in jewelry, but a 14 karat gold ring um, and that's an alloy of gold, um, usually with silver and sometimes copper, it's actually much stronger and more durable. So oftentimes people will opt for that 14 karat gold ring so that's a little bit more durable on your hand. And we'll talk more about alloys when we get to our unit later in the year on solutions. But for now, I want you to see how many alloys you're interacting with on a regular basis. And so we're going to do a little research and do a little activity that will help you see how useful these alloys are. But that's it. That's all I want you to know about metallic bonds. So it's not too bad.